everyone. Thank you for checking out this episode of Really Dicey, a very special episode. We have Jim Johnson, project manager at Modifius, particularly with the Klingon core book, which we have lots and lots of questions to ask. Um, I'm here with, of course, with the great Matt. Yeah, that, I'll, I'll start with the, with the first question. Um, so let's, let's sure. talk about the, about the origins about this book. Um, why don't you um, tell me, how did this project come together, the Klingon core book? Uh, so it came together in a couple of different ways. Let's um, so the the actual the, the game itself came out in 2017, right? We started developing it in 2016 and did a play test, and then uh, the actual core book, the original core book, the Starfleet core book, came out in 2017. And uh, over the last three years, we've had an opportunity to kind of watch what fans are saying about the book and kind of observe what what was happening with the book and like how people were reacting to the rules and to the game. And uh, in the meantime, also Nathan, the 2D20 de uh, rules developer for Modiphius, continued to work on other game lines, right? And continued to uh, refine the rule set and, and, and customize the rule set for different uh, intellectual properties and different games. And so collectively, we were all getting smarter about the 2D20 system. And uh, just the opportunity kind of came along to, uh, we, we were finishing up the initial wave of products. You know, we were finishing up the Alpha Quadrant and the Gamma Quadrant and the Delta Quadrant books. And we were heading into the, uh, I mean, this would have been last summer. We were kind of wrapping up some of those and moving them into post-production. And we were like, okay, what's the next big project we want to start tackling to start, you know, continuing the line beyond this initial uh, release of stuff. And uh, I know that uh, Sam Webb, who was the Star Trek Adventures project manager before me, he, and then he got promoted to head of uh, product development at Modiphius. Um, he, he w and he and I were both aware of like the Klingon core or the Klingon book curse that has been facing uh, uh, RPG, Star Trek RPG lines for the last, you know, 30 years. You know, every, like when Last Unicorn Games had the license, they announced the Klingon book and then folded. And then Decipher had the Star Trek license and announced the Klingon book and then they folded or, you know, they were bought by Wizards of the Coast. So, you know, if you've been in the Star Trek gaming circles long enough, you kind of know that like anytime a game company gets the RPG license and announces a Klingon book that something bad's gonna happen, right? Because they, they'll never be able to get it out in time. So I, I know Sam mentioned uh, not too long ago that he had it in the back of his mind. He wanted to find a way for us to actually break that curse and actually get out the actual Klingon product, whether it was a core book or a, you know, an actual just a supplement. Uh, and just the way it worked out, uh, you know, the two pieces, like we wanted to do a Klingon book and we had three more years of experience with the rule set. We, we knew that we wanted to kind of put a fresh uh, face on the rule set. So we were like, well, this is a perfect opportunity to kind of do both, do a, do a complete core rule book and do a, a slight revision of the rules and, and, and freshen up the presentation of it and also add everything there is to know about Klingons and, mm -hmm. and make it like a, a completely dedicated Klingon product uh, that's an alternate entry into the game. So, you know, you can play Starfleet or you can play Klingon. So now there's two ways to get into the game. The book itself is, is just an alternate way to get into the game. So, you know, you can play Star Trek Adventures as Starfleet, or now you can play it as, as Klingons. And uh, obviously, you, you could play the game as Klingons before by using the either the standard core book or the, uh, the Beta Quadrant book that provided Klingon options. But now yeah. if you wanted to do an actual complete Klingon campaign without Starfleet at all, you have the opportunity to do it with this with this book. Uh, so we just, you know, once we decided to do it, I, this was what last last June is when we decided to to go for it. We started developing it, and now it's you know now it's a year later, and it's it's pretty much pretty much done. You know, it'll be out this fall. But uh, uh, so it's been a long long road, a lot of Klingons over the last year <laughs> to, to be working on. That's for sure. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's absolutely clear that you guys love the Klingons. It's mm -hmm. An incredibly well researched book. Um, but I was wondering what it was particularly about the Klingons that you love. What do you love most about the Klingons? Oh, man. I tell you, I, I fell in love with the Klingons. I mean, way back when I was a kid watching uh, original series reruns on, you know, just a little black and white television screen, I thought that Kang and, and Kor and Koloth, they were just such interesting characters, and they were so different than what we normally saw from like the Starfleet characters and, and from like the, you know, the alien of the week or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they were just a very different culture. Now, of course, you know, you know, back then when I was a kid, I didn't know any better and it didn't even occur to me to be kind of like, uh, you know, offended at the blackface and the, and the, uh, and the makeup yeah. and stuff. And it's like, you know, that, that obviously that was the sixties and it was a very different time and unfortunate, but I think just the, the way they portrayed themselves as very, um, um, in your face and very, not not like i mean they were aggressive certainly but like 
they don't really take any 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 nonsense, right? They are very direct about what they want, and there's something refreshing about that, right? There's there's not a lot of double speak, uh, sure. at least in the original series. They they weren't trying to be duplicitous, or they weren't trying to like uh, you know be a Romulan and be sneaky or whatever. They were like, <laughs> they were like this is what we want, and we're going to get in your face about it. Uh, and then you know when Next Gen came out, of course you know Worf completely redefined the Klingons in a way that we had never really seen before. And, uh, you know, you can attribute Ron G. Moore to uh, a lot of that, uh, you know, world building and culture building that really brought the Klingons um, into a whole different in a whole different realm. And so I just I really appreciate a lot of things about the Klingons, like not just their kind of like quasi Vikings in space vibe that they've got. <laughs> like they're not just crazy, you know, uh, murder hobos going off and killing stuff for the sake of killing stuff. Like they got this whole thread of honor going on in their system. And now, of course, that that definition of honor is a little flexible, right? Depending on who's who's doing it, right? Like, you know, they'll say, this is honorable, this is not honorable. And it's not, you know, if you really spend a lot of time watching a lot of Star Trek, it's not always super consistent, but it works for them, right? And, it, and they're, it's, it's just, it's just fun, fun to see them in a different light. And I thought DS9 especially did a great job of really adding more nuance to Klingons, especially when they got Martok and uh, Worf working together. And you got whole episodes like uh, Soldiers of the Empire is such a great episode because it's all about Klingons. It's, and you get to see what life is like on a Klingon bird of prey and how the crew interacts with each other and how, you know, um, you know, promotions can work. You know, you get you get the threat from the first officer to the captain or, you know, the lower decks uh, can cause problems. And it's just it was just interesting. So I, I love the Klingons. They're just such a fun species to, uh, to play with. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Matt and I, when we did the review of the book, we talked about um, mm -hmm. why this was a core book instead of a, like a supplement book. And um, mm -hmm. one answer we came up with was because um, because when you're working with uh, with the Klingons, every rule has to be reinterpreted with their in their perspective, through their lens, through their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask you: is, Were we correct about that? Is there is there more to it to why this was made as a core book instead of just a um, uh, like the other uh, supplements that Bodifius has made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that ties back to the earlier conversation about how we, we, we knew we had an opportunity to do something big and something different. And um, we, we knew that we wanted to figure out a way to get a, a refreshed version of the rule set out to fans. And this just seemed like a good opportunity to do that. I don't know that it was necessarily because, oh, let's do a Klingon book and let's do a core book on top of it. It's just like we knew we wanted to do both of those somehow. And it just seemed like it, I mean, just at the moment, in the moment of the summer last year, you know, it just seemed to make sense that we just marry the two together and make it happen. Uh, the rule, you know, the rule set itself really hasn't changed any. I think uh, Nathan put together, a, a, you know, an award-winning system from, this, from the get-go. Uh, I think where, where we had challenges, though, was in the presentation of the rules in that core book. Because I know we were working really hard to get that core book ready in time for Gen Con uh, 20, 2017. We were really working hard to get it out in time for launch, and um, I just don't think we we were able to give it quite the uh, same amount of. Well, you know, I, I don't think we gave it. We were, we had the time to give it the the final polish that we really wanted to, to to make everything you know perfect and clear and everything. Of course, there's nothing perfect, right? Um, but so you know, having you know learned all the lessons over the last three years, we just had the opportunity to give it a kind of a fresh top down. Um, you know, a fresh edit and a, an opportunity to add in uh, some flow charts to make things a little easier to understand and to, a lot more example text because uh, we knew that there were places where fans were constantly posting on social media to say, you know, how does this rule work? How does that rule work? And I know that, you know, Nathan and I, especially Nathan, would spend a lot of time on like RPG game boards, you know, writing paragraphs of text explaining the rules, which yeah. is really, which is, you know, really useful because obviously we're, we're helping the fans understand the rule system. But we wanted to figure out a way, how do we get all that information and context into the actual book, right? So that people who don't go into the social media and don't spend time on the RPG forums can actually, you know, just buy the book and understand the rules as it's presented, right? Um, yeah, so I, I think that pretty pretty well covers that. I, I, I don't know that we uh, really consciously decided to avoid making it a supplement. I just, it was just an opportunity to do a full-blown um presentation from a different point of view than Starfleet and the Klingons just seemed the natural uh, the natural choice for that sure sure I get that now the different point of view is uh, really interesting the, the whole idea that you can come into this game and you're you're playing a Klingons obviously mm -hmm. a shit full of Klingons so right. 
what, what in your opinion is kind of the main difference between a Federation Starfleet game and a Klingon game? You know? Well, I think the, you know, the obvious answer would be the fact that the Klingons don't have a prime directive. You know, they yeah, don't, yeah. they don't, they don't approach other civilizations the way the Federation does. Like, you know, the Klingons probably don't care whether you have warp, warp drive capability or not. Right, they're gonna they're gonna look at your culture and your in your planets and say, okay, are you, are you, do you have anything that would benefit the empire? Right, right. and if so, we're gonna we're gonna annex you, and <laughs> if you're if you're belligerent and we have you have things that we want, we're going to you know fight you and take you over or attempt to, and if you have absolutely nothing of value, then we're probably just gonna ignore you. And, and just move on, right? Because if, yeah. if, if you don't have anything to offer the Empire, you don't have anything to make them stronger or more effective, then I think they're just going to move on. And, um, but I, you know, I think really the, the main difference between a Klingon game and a Federation game is that the Klingons approach approach problems very differently, right? They're, they're much more, you know, direct and head on and, and uh, um, you know, they're not going to, they, they get up in your face. And, uh, you know, a first contact situation between you know, Klingons and a species and the Federation and species would be very different because obviously, you know, the, sure. you know, the, the Klingons will, will, will certainly negotiate when they have to, but they, they negotiate from a very different position, right? And, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, Dr. Lawrence uh, Schoen of the King Klingon Language Institute, he was gracious enough to write the foreword to the book for us. And one of the things that he mentioned in his foreword that really resonated with me is that, you know, everything the Klingons do, they do it passionately. And they don't, you know, they don't, they don't soft step around anything, right? They, they, <laughs> they, are, they are fully passionate in everything they do. And yeah. I think there's just, an, there's an appeal to that as a role player and a gamer and even a GM to, to create problems for your crew and, and throw it at them and just see how they react to it differently if they're playing Klingons versus playing a group of Starfleet officers. And uh, I, I just can't wait to see what people come up with over the you know over the coming months and years with this because I, I just love watching what they do with the game as it stands and now that they have the opportunity to, to do it from a Klingon perspective I'm just really excited to see what to see what happens cool all right I, I have a fun question for you um, sure uh, what would you say uh, is your favorite either episode or book that you read on the Klingons that really like drew your that made you a fan of the Klingons Man, there's so many. <laughs> I, I think I loved your essential yeah. viewing that you put in the book. I thought that was Thank great. You. That was Thank really you. That, helpful. Yeah, <laughs> and that took boy, I tell you that that went through a lot of edits. Uh, I, it was actually that that sidebar was actually a full page originally, and I had to cut it. I had to cut it because because <laughs> there was so much content that we wanted to put sure. into the Klingon book. I sure. had to cut it down, and then once the the layout team got hold of it and they were starting to actually lay it out into the book. I was like, okay, I need to cut it even further. So I really had to, I really had to trim it down to the bone, in yeah. terms of wording and like what episodes I was going to offer because there's just a wealth of great um, episodes out there. I think, as much as I love the original series, uh, three episodes, I think, I think um, my favorites are probably the ones with Worf, in the in the Next Generation that really kind of defined him and his character and and the Klingons as a whole. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, Sins of the Father, and Redemption. And um, uh, the, the first one with Kalar was, was at a reunion. I mean, all those episodes, there was just so much Klingon stuff. I mean, it, I, I know that they've been referenced as kind of Shakespearean in, in, in tone in some respects, because they're just so, these storylines are just so fraught with, uh, with stuff, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you know, when, when Picard is, uh, is Worf's Chadich and they go to the Klingon Empire, the Klingon homeworld, you know, they go to Kronos and, uh, you know, they're talking before Kempek and there's that whole backstage discussion about who's really the traitor and you know Duras and Worf are going at it and all this stuff. It's like, wow, there's some there's some deep drama going on here. And this has nothing to do with the Federation and it has nothing to do with um, you know, exploring new worlds or boldly going. It's just like some really deep political stuff that directly impacts one of the main characters, which, you know, as a GM, I love doing that. Like it's it's fine to put together an episode or an adventure that like the crew can generally react to. But when you can pull on somebody's backstory or their culture and really drive it into them and, and say, you know, this episode, you know, you didn't think it was about you initially, but now it's really totally all about you and, it, and about their character and about what, what those, um, what the repercussions are, right? Because like Worf's character changed a huge amount over the course of the next generation. And I think it's a, 
it's unfortunate that Next Generation came out in a time when serialized television wasn't really a thing yet, right? It was very episodic and they couldn't really build on that. I mean, they did the best they could by yeah. doing like a, a Worf episode every season or something. And they took you know great advantage of it. But I think like now with the way television is now, taking a Worf character and doing something with that over the course of an entire season would be just a whole different experience and a lot deeper and with a lot more detail, I think. Yeah, um, that would be interesting. But uh, yeah, so I'd say you know the Worf the Worf series of episodes in uh, in Next Generation are probably my favorite. Um, but like I said before, you know some of the stuff with Martok and the Klingons in general in Deep Space Nine are just fantastic because they just build on everything that the the Next Generation laid as the foundation and just you know took took that on uh, from there. Nice, nice. Uh, now, um, speaking of uh, the the newer shows. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed that the Modifius game doesn't touch on anything after Voyager, right? so there's no Discovery right. or Picard or anything, mm -hmm. uh, or the, um, the Kelvin timelines. Mm -hmm. uh, was that uh, an intent? I mean, obviously, that was an intentional decision. Why did you guys decide to leave that stuff out? Yeah, that's a, that is a, it's actually a really simple uh, reasoning for it. It wasn't exactly a decision, per se, that was made on our part. It, it's just the, the, the nature of uh, licensing a property from CBS. Uh, so CBS, um, you know, we have a license with CBS that covers all the legacy series. So, right. you know, uh, you know, original series, the animated series, Next Gen, DS9, Voyager, Enterprise, mm -hmm. we, we have those series. All the, of the, you know, the first 10 movies uh, we were able to use. We're also able to pull content in from the novels and from the comic books and pretty much every other kind of property that, you know, we can we can slip in and, right. and, and do as Easter eggs for the most part. Um, as long as we're, you know, obviously we're respectful of all the different properties and all the different yeah. licensees, but it's all a shared universe, basically. So we're just taking the pieces that make sense for our purposes. Um, but our license doesn't actually cover Discovery or Picard or the Kelvin movies or Lower Decks or Prodigy or anything else, right? So yeah. at, at some point, if we're able to get those licenses, then absolutely we would find ways to fold all that content in. If we can, I, what I'm not sure about is uh, I, so I'm aware that the Legacy series and Discovery and like Picard, those are all separate licenses, right? Right. Yeah. What I'm not clear on is, um, and, and we'll have to, you know, we would have to talk to CBS about this if, if we go down that road. Um, is you know, can we can we mix content from the Legacy series and Discovery or Legacy series and Picard? Like, can we can we mix all that stuff together into the same product, or do they have to kind of be discrete? Like, even yeah. though it's the same universe and they're all part of the Prime universe. Right. Um, it, you know, I'm not clear on whether we could like, like, could have, could we have added discovery content to the Klingon book if we had the discovery license, or does CBS want us to keep them, you know, discreet? And sure. Uh, sure. you know, yeah. we we yeah. didn't have the license and we didn't have the the ability to do it anyway, so we didn't worry about it for the purposes of the Klingon book. You know, so if we if we did get the discovery license at some point, we would probably just do a separate supplement that kind of like, um, you know, meshed with what we've already done in the Klingon core book. And so that you know, they wouldn't contradict each other, obviously, because I don't think there's really anything in Discovery that directly contradicts what we already know. I think it adds a lot of stuff, and in, in a way, like we would have to do a little bit of mental uh, gymnastics to kind of like fit it in, so that you don't really think too much about you know how the the D sevens were introduced in Discovery, and technically that's before you see them in the uh, Prime timeline. So how does that all mesh together? But you know. The way I think about it is Star Trek writers have been making this stuff up for 50 some years and finding wiggle room in all the different uh, yep. different you know plot inconsistencies and, and story inconsistencies that I'm not too worried about it. And like even if you read enough of the novels, like the novel writers have been doing this for decades, right? Finding finding yep. the, the finding yep. the middle ground and finding finding a way to make it all work. And uh, so you know I'm confident if we go, if we get to that point, you know we'll make it work. Um, oh, I'm sure you will. You guys so, are great at that. That um, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That little sidebar about the Dominion symbol that you had in the Delta book, <laughs> yeah. Was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's terrible, and this is why. And that's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that was Jacob Ross uh, wrote that section, and uh, I thought he did a great. I I, I laughed when he he sent me the manuscript, and I just laughed for you know yeah. a couple it of minutes, and then so I didn't, went to work. <laughs> It makes yeah. so much sense. The minion would just mm -hmm. be thumbing their nose at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, wander off topic. Though. No, no worries. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm curious. Where 
I'm sure you get this question all the time. So what's what's mm -hmm. next on on the agenda? What what books are you cooking up next uh, for the future? Uh, so we did a we did a Day of Honor event a couple weeks ago with a few of the other licensees. We had uh, Eagle Moss and uh, Star Trek Online, and uh, I think a couple a, a bunch of the actors got together as well. And we did a bunch of different panels, and uh, at that we did a panel on the Klingon book, and we had uh, Rick Sternbach uh, talking with us for a little bit about his experiences, uh, specifically around you know Klingons in general. But uh, we we announced at that panel that our next big project after the Klingon book is the uh, Shackleton Experience campaign setting, which uh, if you're familiar with the living campaign that we started back in 2017, that was an attempt by us to kind of create a, uh, uh, well, first of all, we, we, we got a section of the beta quadrant called the Shackleton Expanse that we created out of whole cloth. And CBS said, you know, this is kind of cool. Go, go, go run with it, do whatever you want with it. You know, feel free to, you know, expand on it, do whatever you want to do with it. Because uh, no one was doing anything in particular in the beta quadrant. And you know we're not canon anyway, so they were like, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, go for it, go crazy. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it reminded me of when FASA had the the triangle. You know, they created that whole triangle campaign setting. They had a section of the of the of the um, you know Star Trek galaxy called the triangle, and they did a lot of adventures and campaigns around that. And so this was an opportunity for us to to kind of make a make a unique you know mark on the on the on the IP. And so we uh, commissioned uh, Dayton Ward. And Scott Pearson, who are uh, Dayton Ward, is a you know huge uh, Star Trek novelist, uh, one you know New York Times, USA Today bestseller, all that stuff. And he's a he's a very good friend of mine too. Uh, but so we commissioned Dayton Ward and Scott Pearson. Scott Pearson is a Star Trek writer. Uh, he also happens to be the 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 main copy editor for all the Star Trek novels over the last several years. And, and I've known him for a number of years. So he's our canon editor on all of our books. So you know I get a manuscript, I go through it and clean up as much as I can. And then any, I hand it over to Scott and say, okay, Scott, it's it's your job to find any canon stuff that I miss because he's he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of everything <laughs> Star Trek beyond what I know because like I know the movies and the TV series really well and all the old RPG books, but like he's read all the novels and I haven't read all the novels. Like there's so many novels, like, I've read a lot of them, but I haven't been able to retain the information like quite like he has. So you know, as we're working on a manuscript, if I say, hey, Scott, I need a I need a novel reference to like this event. Like, there's, I need a I need some sort of interesting Klingon event that happened somewhere between 2200 and 2250. Do you have anything for me in the novels? And he'll he'll like he'll get, he'll give me five or six options. And I'm like, this is great. It's like it's like he's like an instant encyclopedia of novel Star Trek novel knowledge, which is that has been invaluable. Uh, plus, the questions he comes up with uh, when he sees stuff in the manuscripts are great. But uh, I, I you know I, I digress. I apologize. And you know I've. I've been talking now. <laughs> I forgot what the question was. I apologize. What was what was the question? Um, uh, well, um, then we'll ask you what's next. But oh, I no, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Shackleton Expanse, right? So, uh, so anyway, we uh, Scott and Dayton put together this this meta plot of what would be happening in the Shackleton Expanse. So they, they kind of detailed what the expanse is. It's this huge unexplored region of the Beta Quadrant, full of weird uh, spatial anomalies and uh, te Tetrion eddies and weird stuff that's happening and. No one quite knows why, because no one's really delved into it. No one take, has claimed this area. You know, the Romulans are interested in it. The Klingons are interested in it. The Federation's interested in it. You have independent smugglers and traders that kind of like wander in there from time to time. Uh, but you know, the the hook is that there's clearly something weird going on, and so they developed this this overarching story of uh, of this ancient alien species that that tie into a like, massively um, advanced technology. And so we did this living campaign, which the intention was we would release a new adventure every month and fan, you know, the gamers would play it and then send us feedback about how it went. Like what happened, you know, did, did this happen? Did this happen? You know, what, how did you handle this sort of thing? And the intention was that we would, the writers would, would shape the campaign based on the input we were getting from players, right? And just kind of grow it from there so that the fans yeah. really had some input into what was happening and how it would progress. Uh, so that was the idea, anyway. I, I don't think at the time any of us realized how much work was involved in, in <laughs> making that happen. And, and not only, you know, not only did we have to write it and then, you know, get it out to the public, and then wait for their feedback, and then read their feedback, and react to their feedback, and then figure out how to implement that feedback. But what we didn't think about is that there was also a whole the whole layer of CBS approvals, right? CBS has to approve everything that we've released for the game. 
And all of a sudden, instead of us releasing it once a month, it was like, oh, well, we have a two week window of approvals we have to wait for. So not only do we have to have the time to write it and edit it and develop it, we have to have the time for people to play it and, and, and you know experience the, the, sure. the episode. But then we've got to write it and revise it and then send it to CBS for approval and then release. So all of a sudden, our one month window turned into three months, turned into four months. And then, you know, the release schedule kind of became, uh, you know, I- internally, it was a bit of a laugh because we were like, you know, the fans were like, hey, we finished the next episode. When's the next one coming out? And it's like, oh, you know, a couple months because we're still <laughs> yeah, we're still right. catching up. And uh, so ultimately, we decided, you know, let's get the first you know season done. And we got the first the first season done. And then we kind of put it on hold because we were like, what do we do with it now? Because we, we know we don't have the resources or the time to um, to really do it the way we wanted to do a living campaign. So we kind of let it set for a while and we thought about it and thought about it and, and threw a lot of stuff on the whiteboard and like trying to figure out what can we do with this. And, and finally, we decided, well, why don't we, we all the pieces are there, right? If you look at the adventures that we released for both the original series timeline and the next gen timeline, you know, the two concurrent story tracks that we were that we were developing we were like well you know we've de- we've added a lot a lot of content uh just within the adventures for the shackleton expanse so why don't we just turn this into a full-blown campaign setting in addition to this huge meta plot that's going on and, yeah. and so that's that that evolution kind of turned it into this this book that we're working on now which is going to be you know a, a big hardcover not as big as the klingon core book but you know a good meaty card b- bigger than most of the supplements i think uh, as, it, as it's laying out right now but um, it'll be partly, here's all the setting information about the Shackleton Expanse that you could possibly want to run adventures in that for a long time. And I'm taking design cues from, from uh, Dungeons and Dragons, obviously, right? Uh, Forgotten Realms, Dark Sun, Eberron. You know, when you buy those books, that's a full, complete campaign setting in one book, right? And it's like, even if you think about the, uh, the Great Pendragon campaign, right? The big, massive, meaty book that for Pendragon 5th edition, um, where it's like, all you need is the core rule book and, the sh- and and that campaign setting book and you're set for you know decades of gaming you know joy because it's like there's so much stuff in there right uh, I, I just love the Pendragon campaign i wish i could get back to it because <laughs> there's just so much stuff in there right um but uh so the, the intention that i have with the, the shackleton book is um that we throw as many tools into it as we possibly can and say okay gm Here's this Shackleton Expanse. Go, go crazy with it, right? Go do everything you can possibly do with it and have fun. And and the great thing that I'm I'm really grateful that Medivius, uh, gr- well, greenlighted it, but that it worked. The timing worked out um, that we did the Klingon core book first because the Shackleton Expanse. One of the conceits about the Shackleton Expanse is that the the Federation station that's closest to the Expanse is actually a jointly run station between the Klingons and the Federation. It's Narendra Station named in honor of the you know the attack on Narendra 3 and so we have this we have this station that's run by Klingons and Federation together which means that the Shackleton Expanse you know book you can use that whether you're using the Starfleet core rule book or the Klingon core rule book you know if you're if you're playing a Klingon campaign you can buy that that Shackleton Expanse uh, product and use it just as as effectively as a Starfleet crew would because we're going to add as much content into it as we possibly can to make sure that if you're running a Klingon crew, here's all the stuff you can do as a Klingon crew, and it's going to be just as interesting and crazy as anything that the Starfleet crew will do. Uh, it's going to be a little tricky to do the writing. Like, we'll have to make sure that the sidebars, you know, make sense and that all of the yeah. content is laid out in such a way that the the adventures that are presented are, um, you know, agnostic as to whether you're a Starfleet crew or a Fed- or a Klingon crew. You know, obviously, we'll we'll provide as much guidance as we can to say, okay, you know. Here's the situation. Now, normally the Federation would be approaching this as a first contact situation, but the Klingons don't care about that. So <laughs> here's the resources that the Klingons might be interested in. And uh, so by presenting this as, as a big, gigantic toolkit, I'm hoping that's going to give game masters and players like just tons of stuff to play with and to do things with. Uh, that's that's the hope anyway. I mean, we'll see what how it comes together, right? <laughs> but that, that's the intention of the Shackleton, and that's the, that's the big project on our plate right now. Uh, beyond that, I can't really say. Um, I, you know, I've talked on other um, interviews that I have this, you know, gigantic mental whiteboard, and I, I mean, I've even got one on, on on my computer. I use a Scrivener for all my writing, so I've got this huge corkboard, virtual corkboard, just full of stuff that I'm, that you know, either I have come up with because I've got 30 odd years of Star Trek gaming experience, <laughs> and I'm, I'm steeped in the lore, right? So, like as a gamer, I know what I want. 
I know what I want to see on the shelves. I know what I want in my toolkit when I go to my game sessions with my players. Um, but also, you know, thanks to the glory of the internet and social media, I see I see comments from fans all the time on on Facebook or on the the Modifius forums about their wish lists and their ideas and, and what they would like to see. And like, there's a, sometimes there's stuff that's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. How do I make that work? You know. And uh, you know, as in my role now as a uh, as project manager, you know, I get the unglamorous job of figuring out budget and spreadsheets and all that great stuff because you know, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> at the end of the day, this is a business, right? Yeah. And and the products that we create have to have to make money. And yeah. uh, I hate to say it, right? Because I'd rather just make cool stuff and just like, you know, push it out to the masses and say, just make make this cool stuff and have fun. But ultimately, everything's got a everything has a price tag on it, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's where the the number crunching comes into play. Is like, I'd like to really do this cool product. How do I make the numbers work so that a it doesn't cost too much to produce, and b it doesn't cost too much to the end user? You know, I don't want the fans to feel like they're getting they're getting uh, you know. Uh, reamed for a lot of money for not a lot of product you know and that yeah. that just gives me heartache to see really cool products that are like you know a hundred dollars or something ridiculous like that it's like yeah you know where's the value in that right so yeah. that, that's what i've really been trying to do is as the project managers try to like really pack these books full of value um as much as possible just to give you guys and, and other fans out there just more stuff to play with because you know the star trek setting is 50 some years old and it's just massive and there's just so much that we haven't even touched yet and we're what three and a half years into the game and there's just so much we can still do with it even if we didn't add discovery or picard or lower sure. decks or anything else right there's just so much more content that we can still get to um yeah so a, a lot of stuff on the whiteboard that i would love to get greenlit uh, i think COVID has really thrown everything into a into a into a tailspin and some to some extent because um like we can do we could do digital releases all day long because the the price i mean the the budget is is pretty favorable right because you don't have to worry about the distribution costs or the printing costs the printing costs are the big the big thing is uh, you know when you want to do a hardcover or you want to do a box set or something you got to really think about you know components and costs and all that stuff but you know a pdf really once you've laid it out and done the the development costs there's not really much to it other than you know posting it up on drive through rpg and midifius is a store and uh and firing away but uh, uh so there's a lot of products that i would like to work on in some format or another but uh, nothing to nothing to announce yet. you know I, i've talked about the whiteboard and, and like if you look at the the wish lists that are out there um i'm like yep yep those are all on the wish list <laughs> like everything i yeah i think I, i'd have to really look at the uh at the fan wish lists it, it would take me a while to look at them and, and find something that was truly new and i don't mean that in the negative connotation sure. it's just that yeah. because i've been doing this for three years now you know in official capacity uh but as a gamer i've been thinking about this for my you know 30 some years now you know playing star trek it's like i know what i want you know like i was saying <laughs> I, you know i know what i want for products and and i know that there's huge fan demand for like a romulan book and a ferengi book and a cardassian book and those are tricky because on the one hand yeah, you want those because you want to be able to play a Cardassian or you want to be able to play a Romulan or whatever. And certainly you can play those characters in the game, but it's a little different to play like the first Klingon in Starfleet or, or I guess the second because Nog was the first um, or to play a Cardassian in Starfleet or something. But it's different to play a Cardassian themed game, right? Where everybody's a Cardassian. Uh, I think there's a, there's a slippery slope that we, we started to kind of skate down with the Klingon book where, where if you're if you're playing a campaign entirely devoted to these specific species, you're 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 kind of hitting on the tone of Star Trek a little bit. It's like what what is Star Trek about? You know, as a as a as an IP and an ethos and everything, and like, uh, yeah. is playing a Romulan game really in line with that? You know, where the Romulans are very yeah. have a very different approach to things, right? And uh, you know, I, I want to be careful because I know that there are things going on now in in the gaming circles where you don't want to peg a species as all evil like i i've been reading a lot of discussion about this around D D about how uh you know orcs have always been kind of maligned as the orcs are evil and that's it and that's you know you know you can look at that through a certain lens as kind of racist right uh so you know are all romulans deceitful and and spies and and nasty and that kind of thing you know are all cardassians you know fascists and uh you know quasi uh, you know, Nazi Germany. It's like, well, no, probably not. You know, there's individuals within that, but 
I think, you know, if we were to do something like that, we would just have to handle it very carefully so that we're not, we're not saying, yeah, play a Cardassian campaign and, you know, go subjugate other worlds and, uh, and go, go have a occupation on Bajor and, you know, commit your own Holocaust. Wouldn't that be fun? Because yeah. obviously, you know, nobody working for Star Trek Adventures, you know, we all love the property so much that we would, I think we would really struggle to do that, it, it, just to do it, right? And of course, well, you know, the, even, if, even if we did something like that, I think CBS would kind of look at that and go, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, we, we've, we've gotten to a great place with CBS now where, I mean, they have so much respect for us. We have so much respect for them that we have a great working relationship with them. And they know how passionate we are about the property and about everything about Star Trek. And, and like, you know, we've gotten some very favorable comments when we send the manuscripts or art or whatever to approve, you know, they're, they're very positive about what we're doing and they're very happy with us as partners. Um, so I just, I want to be really careful that, you know, certainly we'll do a, it, we'll find a way to do a Romulan supplement and a Klingon supplement or not a Klingon supplement, but uh, you know, Cardassians, et cetera. We'll figure out a way to do those if we can make it, you know, profitable enough to do it but it, i'm going to have to be really careful to find good writers who can who can toe that line of like it would be a cool experience to play romulans without maybe you know i don't want to I, I don't want to ignore the reality of like you know what it would be to be a romulan in their society and in their experience with the tal shiar you know looking behind every you know looking over your shoulder all the time right or or the cardassians where you've got the obsidian order you know, looking your over your shoulder all the time, like you know, that's a very different experience than the Federation. And you know, of course, you got Section Thirty One, but that's kind of a that's kind of a, a a niche case, right? You can pretty safely ignore Section Thirty One without really impacting a, a Federation game. But right. to play the Romulans or to play the Cardassians without the Tel Shiar or without the Obsidian Order, that it just kind of takes away from the whole, you know. Romulan nests or the Klingon or Cardassian nests of, of those experiences. So, I think we'd have to find a really good balancing point to to say, you know, yeah, you can play Cardassians, but be very delicate about how we handle like what Cardassians do, or at least what we've seen them do in the context of the of the series. And you know, because certainly the occupation wasn't just one person, right? It wasn't just Dukat being being Dukat. It was it was the entire society structure of the Cardassians doing this without you know without a lot of Cardassians really saying oh gosh this is wrong we shouldn't be doing this they were like you know this is this is who we are you well, know so yeah. there's, there's a fine line there that we'll have to we'll have to work on but, no, we'll, it, we'll figure it out <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely it would definitely be very tricky um uh Emmanuel and I you know we we had a discussion about uh you know even that uh, issue in the Klingon book, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as much as yeah. I love the Klingons, there is a little bit of a problem when you make them player characters, and you know, it is standard Klingon, you know, um, uh, you know, practice to move a native population by force off their planet and strip mine it for the Empire. Right. That's yeah. A little dodgy. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a that's a again it, it, it harkens back to that slippery slope I was talking about. Like yeah, we exactly. we could have we could have gone into detail about you know how how Klingons at least from what we understand subjugate other species and, and you know I don't know that they necessarily enslave them but they certainly you know put the heel down when they when they feel it appropriate. It's something that you don't really see much on the shows themselves. Like they they might reference it here and there, but like right. I, I'm have, I'm almost done with another. I'm almost done with another rewatch of DS9, and I don't remember it coming up once in any of the conversations between Worf and Martok or Martok and Garon or whatever. Like, it's probably like in the background, right? But it's not something that they've ever focused on in the episodes that I, that I can recall. And I think that's the route we took is like, we're just, and I don't know, this might have been a dodge. And you know, I'll, I'll rely on the fans to tell us, you know, did we soft, did we soft shoe our way around it? Or, you know, should we have been more direct or whatever? But, like we were just trying to create a cool gaming experience, and uh, you know, to be Klingons and, and not really focus so much on the fact that, you know, maybe they do some not great stuff with other species and and species they subjugate or whatever. But uh, um, I don't know. I, I guess we'll see what the what the fan reaction is once the book actually comes out in print. I think we'll see even more stuff, more com more conversations about it um, online. I, I think the conversations have been pretty good right now because because of, of the digital sales. Uh, of the of the of the pre-order, but I'll, I'll be really curious to see what happens once the actual book itself hits stores 
and more people get their hands on it. Um, ho hopefully they're kind, but you know, we'll take it in stride. I think you guys did, uh, I think you did a fine job. I think you did exactly what the shows in the movie did. Right. Which is to kind of not focus on. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a perfectly legitimate thing to do um, because that's how the show does it. People want to right. play adventures in the show. I think that's a perfectly fine way. And I mean, you know, the other way to do it would be to jump in with two feet and say, let's play fascists. Mm -hmm. which, you know, I don't think you guys want to do. <laughs> correct, correct, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, the Klingons have never really been portrayed as fascists on, this, on, the, on the TV show. Like, you know, maybe a, maybe a particular chancellor might kind of yeah. skew the High Council in that direction for, yeah. for a short period of time. Um, although the High Council being what it is, right, they may not stand for that and say, you know, this, this way of of thinking is is not what we like so we're going to challenge you to a duel and off you go and uh, we'll just replace that with the you know different status quo or whatever right. um and, and, and you know plus that whole honor uh you know thread plays into it it's like is it is it really honorable to do things that you know fascists traditionally do i don't know uh i don't know I, you know but uh yeah, so again, that's something we would have to think about. You know, maybe maybe we just uh, trust the audience and do that with a Klingon or with a Cardassian book and a Romulan book. We say, you know, maybe in a sidebar, something like, you know, here's the reality of Romulans and or the the reality as we understand it from canon. You know, right, right. Of, and, and we'll just rely on the game masters and the players to like figure it out. Yeah. You know, if that's the kind of game you want to run, you know. The, the Medifius Star Trek Adventures police are not coming to your house to, to <laughs> tell you not to play it that way, right? That's not what we're here to do. We're, right. we're, just, pre we're just presenting a toolkit and saying, yep. do something cool with this. Do something Star trek -y with it and uh, and then tell us about it because we want to hear all the cool stuff that you're doing. Um, so I, I guess it's just a, you know, it's just a, it's, it's that balance point that you've got to play as a, as a, as a designer and a developer is like, you know, how far do you, how far into the weeds do you go? Yeah. Or do you just kind of do what the episodes do and just kind of like, in some cases, skate along the surface? I mean, obviously DS9 and the next gen and Voyager did some deep dives into some really hard stuff, right? Especially DS9, because they, they had some really hard episodes where you don't get that happy, that happy feeling at the end of the episode. You know, you don't get the laugh track at the end or you, you don't get the, right. the smiles on the bridge that you get so often in the original series, which is great. Like I, I love the original series so often ended on a high note, but mm -hmm. there's some really dark stuff <laughs> in DS9 and, uh, and and Voyager, and you're like, whoa, how am I supposed to feel coming out of this episode? That wasn't, <laughs> you know, that was like, ew, that's yeah. kind of creepy. And and maybe that's the approach we take with the Romulan game or Cardassian game, where you just say, you know, this is still holding true to the Star Trek um, ideals of a, of a better future in general, right. whether, you're, whether you're Cardassian or, or Romulan or, or Federation or whatever, there, there is a better future out there. Um, but there's that there's that twist, right? There's that yeah, that, yeah. that other element to it that you know things aren't always going to be you know peachy keen, you know. So you have to deal with that, and how do you deal with that in the terms of the game experience? You know, it would obviously require some trust between the, the game master and the players to an extent, I and mean, maybe um, maybe a, mo a more mature game group than you might normally expect from from some games, perhaps. I don't yeah. know. That's fair. That's I was thrilled. Uh, I was going to ask you about the Shackles and Expanse. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely thrilled that that is your next project because I love that idea. When I first read that in the Beta Quadrant book, uh, I was just I thought that was that idea was fantastic. And when you brought it up again in the Klingon book, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I can't wait to dive into the Shackles. Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, and I, I even told uh, Fred. Uh, Fred Love wrote the uh, the introductory adventure that's in the Klingon book. And I said, you know, do whatever you want with this, you know, but, but make sure that at the end of it, that, <laughs> that you fold in the fact that they're heading for the, for the, for Narendra station somehow. And yeah. actually the, yeah. uh, the adventure in the uh, Starfleet Corps book does that too. You know, you have an adventure on the way to uh, Narendra station. So, you know, the intent, you know, baseline intent was that, you know, if somebody only picks up the core rule book, uh, either core rule book, and they play that introductory adventure to get started, they're both pointing toward the Shackleton expanse. And, you know, obviously not necessarily to, to try to drum up sales, but just to say, hey, here's a, here, you know, if you look at the flow chart of Star Trek Adventures, you know, you've got the Starfleet Core Rule Book, you've got the, the Quick Start, the free Quick Start PDF, you've got the Starter Set, Box Set, and then and now you've got the Klingon Core Rule Book. So you've got four different avenues to get into the game. 
and at least two of them point directly to the Shackleton Expanse as a place to go explore. Because uh, well, I, you know, because I remember you know way back in the day when I was when I was getting my feet with feet wet with RPGs, you know, the the um, the Greyhawk box set that came out for for D and D. And then the gray, uh, the gray Forgotten Realms box set for Forgotten Realms. Man, those were the those were the the holy grails of D and D for me because it was like, it was like I could get the the core rule books and like know how to play the game and have the rules and have the monster manual. And so I'm ready. I like I got everything, all the pieces I need. Now I need somewhere to go explore. I need to go somewhere to go adventure, and to wrap my head and my players around, we can go adventure in Greyhawk. And here's this box set full of all this great stuff that we could do for years, right? Or now here's the Forgotten Realms and here's some awesome stuff from the Forgotten Realms that we can just do for years. It was great for me as a game master because, you know, when I was young and stupid, I wasn't that creative. <laughs> I couldn't come up with a whole setting on my own. Like, I could come up with scenarios and adventures and dungeon delves for, for my players to deal with. But, like, to, to conceptualize a whole setting that that was happening in, I didn't have that yet. Like, I didn't have that developmentally as a writer or whatever. I didn't, I just had, well, it wasn't there yet. So for someone to drop Forgotten Realms on me or to drop Greyhawk on me and say, here's this whole world that you can go adventure in, or to plug your adventures into, I was like, that was heaven for me. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was a godsend. Uh, yeah. But now, you know, now, of course, now that I'm older, uh, now I don't, I still don't have any time, right? And now, <laughs> instead of, like, trying to create something whole cloth, it's like, I need some help. And so, like, when, when I got the, uh, the Forbidden Lands box set from Free League, right, that was awesome because it was a complete setting in a box. Like, here's the rules, here's the setting go go crazy and it's like oh this is great because now you know i can come up with adventures and scenarios and stuff but i don't have to do all the work involved in creating the entire setting as well which you know i, I love to world build just as much as any writer but you know it, it's that whole time factor right it's like how yeah. much time do you have to do your yeah. to do your life stuff and then and then just play games much less try to create this whole world in addition to it so my, my intention is that the shackleton experience is this huge is going to be this huge toolkit full of stuff you know like uh, you know harkening back to my my feeling when i got forgotten realms and and greyhawk to say okay you know prospective star trek adventures gm here's the core rule book whichever direction you decided to take whether you took whether you took the klingon path or the starfleet path great because you know welcome to the game because we want you to be playing with it but now we're going to hit you over the head with this with a shackleton expanse like if you don't have time to, to create your own setting and you've got you know a little bit of time to create your own episodes, and you want to do some cool stuff. Here's this complete setting that you can play with and throw it at your players because they've never seen it before, right? The Shackleton Expanse is a section of the Star Trek universe that that literally nobody else is touching because you know either they don't know about it or none of the licensees have really touched on it or, or even you know conceptualized playing with it. Um, you know we would love to, right? We would love for you know Star Trek Online or somebody to to join us and do some really cool shit with it, right? <laughs> but uh, it just hasn't happened yet. We, you know, we're, working on, we're working on those relationships. Um, but uh, I think to hand a Game Master a complete campaign setting in the Shackleton Expanse and say, here's all the things that are happening in the Expanse now as a baseline, right? You are feel, you know, feel free to go whatever direction you want to with it, right? We're gonna lay, we're gonna lay a whole lot of track for you and, and also provide you a whole lot of iron, right? So you can lay your own track and do some do whatever crazy stuff you want to in it. So I I hope it I hope it comes together the way I want. Like in my head, like I've got this vision for what it's going to look like. Uh, whether it actually comes together or not is is hard to say because you know any project of this magnitude, even the Klingon book, you know any project of this magnitude <laughs> is full of compromise. Like you, you get into it, and you're like, oh, I would love to do this, but the reality is we have to do this, and so it's, yeah. it's like. You, you get over that initial disappointment of like, oh, I really wanted to do, you know, X, but now we have to do Y. And it's like, yeah. you know, I, I get a couple hours of feeling let down and then I get all jazzed up again because we're actually doing Star Trek, right? Because like, this is this is a dream job and uh, I am grateful every single day to be working on it the way I'm working on it. And, and so grateful to be working, you know, to interact with, with, with folks like you and the fans online and just everybody I've interacted with. And um, I, I just, I, I'm at a point in my life where I, I try to make sure I express my gratitude every day because, like, this is such a great universe and a great setting. And and to have been on the periphery of Star Trek for so many years, writing uh, short stories and, and uh, novel pitches and stuff, um, to finally be in a position to to be shaping a little tiny piece of the of the property is just a it's just a dream job. And uh, again, just grateful to be here. And and uh, you know, I've got all the uh, all the uh, 
FASA and Last Unicorn and Decipher stuff right here on the shelf next to my Medifia stuff. And I'm looking at it literally every single day, uh, flipping through it, looking for, mining for ideas, thinking about the, the, the shoulders we're standing on now and, and yep. knowing that, that we're carrying on that <laughs> legacy and, and knowing that, you know, someday there's going to be another company coming up after us, you know, I don't know, because, you know, I don't see Star Trek going away any, at least in my lifetime, uh, <laughs> the way, the way they're doing new series now. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, certainly Modiphius will, will continue to, to do this stuff for as long as it remains profitable. Like I've gotten no sense that we're going to, you know, quit anytime soon because there's plus as long as CBS keeps coming out with new series, we're like, yeah, green light prodigy, green light lower decks, you know, bring it on. Cause like, we'll figure out a way to do something with it and, uh, and have fun with it. So, uh, um, Anyway, I, you know what? I, I'm rambling, so I, I apologize no, for just going no, off, okay, off on here. But the, it, what other questions can I ask? Can I answer for you guys? Uh, that, that, I think you yeah. covered everything I had. <laughs> yeah, same, same here. Same here. Um, awesome. All right, so um, I'm just really excited. It sounds like you're doing some fantastic work and have some great projects in mind. And um, I've said it before in almost every review we do, you guys. It is clear that you guys are really hardcore trackies and mm -hmm. that is fantastic it's just so good to see um this being done by people that care and you know that's so clear in what you've done and i want to thank you i mean as a as a trekkie and, a, and as a gamer and as a game game master yeah yeah i, I i'm great on. this is great stuff yeah I'm, I'm grateful for those comments thank you so much for that i i have uh i have so I, I mentioned that I was a, a Star Trek short story writer. So I guess 2004, um, I had a short story published in uh, one of the Strange New Worlds anthologies. And if you're not familiar with it, um, Pocket Books, uh, they have the license to do all the Star Trek novels. They, they ran a contest for 10 years, uh, a short story contest, where they would say, okay, uh, Star Trek fans, if you can write you know, a professional quality, you know, professional grade story and submit it to our editor, you know, we'll review them over the course of a few months and then we'll select the best you know, 20 or 25 or whatever that year and publish them in an anthology and, and kind of do some fan service. And it harkened back to where when Paramount was doing Next Generation in DS9, they were actually the only studio in town uh, accepting spec scripts from yeah. fans, right? So if you were a fan and you thought you could write a script for Star Trek Next Generation or Star Trek DS9, you would put together a script, a full blown, you know, 120 page script and send it to CBA or send it to Paramount and they had a whole cadre of people reading scripts and the ones that they liked, they would invite the, those writers in for pitch sessions and say, you know, we like your script. Obviously we're not going to buy the script, but we want you to pitch story ideas to us. And then they would go on from there. So uh, uh, pocket books, you know, kind of latched onto that idea. And uh, John Ordover, the editor at the time and uh, Dean Wesley Smith uh, put this whole contest together of strange new worlds where they would solicit fans to send stories in. Anyway, all that being said, um, they, they ran the contest for 10 years and I, I, I managed to get a, a story into three of the anthologies. And, and so that, that experience got me into kind of the, the Star Trek fiction circle in a way, because there's a convention here in Maryland every year called Shore Leave. And that was, uh, it's close enough to New York that all the writers and editors in New York from Pocketbooks would come down to Shore Leave and they would do this whole event where they would talk about all the new novel releases coming out in the next year. Because at the time, uh, DS9 and Voyager and all, all the movies were coming out. So Star Trek was really big at the time. And they were doing two mass market novel releases every month. So like they just had a huge machine going in, in terms of like new novels constantly coming out. And they had a huge cadre of, uh, of writers who were constantly coming out with new novels. You know, they had Dayton Ward and David Mack and uh, Scott Pearson and uh, Christopher Bennett, uh, just uh, Greg Cox, um, uh, Harvey Weinstein, uh, Michael Jan Friedman, like all the, all the big names of Star Trek novels from the past, you know, 15, 20 years, were constantly coming out with new, uh, uh, Kirsten Beyer. In fact, you know, Kirsten, before she, she went on to be a uh, producer on Discovery, she was doing a lot of Voyager novels, right? Uh, 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 Dr. Una McCormick uh, did a bunch of stuff for DS9 too. So it's just, uh, you know, all these writers we're going to this convention every year and, and talking Star Trek and, and doing stuff. And as the Strange New Worlds writers, as we were coming in, you know, getting our, our little public, you know, we had little short stories and like we're sitting sitting shoulder to shoulder with the novel giants, right? 
but it was a great way to meet people and to interact and to talk to them and, and build relationships, right? And so over the years, as I continued to go to shore leave, I built relationships with all these, all these Star Trek super geeks, just like me, who, who were writing novels and writing other stuff. And like Dayton Ward now, he's a consultant with CBS, uh, and he does a lot of stuff for CBS now. Um, like, and he also has written a lot of novels and a lot of the, uh, the other books that um, are Star Trek in nature, but aren't necessarily novels, like some of the, the reference material and some of the, some of the nonfiction books. And like I, I've developed friendships with all these guys and, and ladies and it's just to finally be in this position working on this game, I was able to kind of like pull on those threads and say, hey, I'm doing this RPG. Would you like to come play in, in the Star Trek universe in kind of a different angle than the fiction? And, and what I've discovered is by doing that, uh, the fans have noticed to some extent, like the fans who are really deeply, deeply into reading the novels and recognize the novelist names now they see those same names appearing in the game and that adds just a whole different layer of connectivity between the novels and the game like we've got uh, keith de canada was one of the main writers i got on the klingon book and he's just written a ton of stuff on klingons over the years in his novels and so when someone's you know a fan sees the klingon empire core rule book by Modiphius, like well who's Modiphius? we don't know who Modiphius is but they look at the list of credits and they say, keep the Canada. Well, I know him because he's, he's written a whole bunch of Star He's written a whole bunch of Klingon novels. You know, this has been an opportunity. This has been an unexpected opportunity for us to tap into a, a, a subset of the, of the fan base that may not necessarily have picked up an RPG book before, but are now looking at it because of the names that we've been able to kind of pull in. Like I've got Dayton and I've got Keith and I've got Scott and uh, some of the other uh, writers that have been able to, and Chris Bennett and stuff. Um, so I'm just grateful that a I'm grateful that a I know these people, and and that that I'm good enough friends with them that they're willing to come in and play with me uh, on on the game because it's a very different. We didn't have time to touch on it, but like writing for a game is very different than writing fiction. And uh, I, I know a couple of them had to kind of like bend their brain a little bit to kind of work around how like they're writing a story, but they have to write a story without any characters. Right. right. They can't. Right. They can't write, and they can't write an adventure, ep an adventure mission, expecting a certain character to do a certain thing. Like they have to. They have to. The right. right. They have to write to the archetypes as opposed to specific characters, right. and, and and that has been a fun experience to try to teach them, like how to do that without like you're not writing for Picard, you're not writing for Kirk, you're not writing for for Kang, you're writing for somebody else's Klingon captain or somebody else's captain. So yeah. like any yeah. of the real personal stuff, you've got to be really careful with. So it's just a, it's, it's just been a fun experience. Uh, so again, you know, grateful every day to be here. And, you know, I just, I, I love reading the fan reactions online to seeing to, to, to what they're coming up with and doing with the game. Uh, that's the re most rewarding part for me, honestly, is just seeing what you guys do with all this cool stuff that we're throwing at you. <laughs> and, and, so, yeah. Thank you everyone for watching uh, and thank you Jim Johnson for uh, giving us uh, some time to give you these, these questions and thank you for your answers and um, uh, everyone take care. Thank you very much.